Hello and welcome to NARC Live on Wednesday the 3rd of January 2024. Coming, happy 2024, happy new year to you. Coming to you live from Norfolk on the east coast of England with me, David G7RP, and sadly Tammy M0TC is only here in spirit because she is not well. Um, she has succumbed to one of the many bugs that are around at this time of year. I'm sure you know of them. Ironically, she went to look after her mum and dad and has come down with the same thing um, as they do. But she, I'm sure she's looking now and um, she's helped me this afternoon as much as she can remotely um, to sort of uh, help me get sorted in for this. So we'll do the best we can as we always try and do. So on the show tonight, we have Frank W3LPL on solar maximum during 2024 and its effect on amateur radio propagation. We share some of your news and pictures and we find out what on earth this is. We've got a few answers, so thanks very much for those people who sent that in. Sadly though, I have to start with some sad news. Simon M0TRJ, who was a member of our club, passed away this last Monday, two days ago. We used to see Simon at some meetings and events like International Marconi Day in particular, I remember we saw him. But in recent years, he's been suffering some serious health problems and he went to live in Bristol where his mother looked after him. Thank you to his friend Dave 2E0WPZ for letting me know earlier today. Simon M0TRZ, who is now silent key. Uh, we haven't got too much club news for you, to be honest, this week. I'm going to mention again, though, the website testers. We are developing a new website, or Mark G0 LGJ is our webmaster, and uh, he welcomes anybody who wishes to help, particularly if you run a slightly unusual platform, you know, an unusual tablet or computer uh, that maybe not everybody does, a different browser maybe that other people use um, to look at the website, or you've maybe experienced issues yourself in the past. He would love to hear from you. The details of how to contact him are on our website. And also, just a, uh, another mention of this, which is our membership. As you know, we're now well into 2024, so we would encourage you to please rejoin the club. It's just £10 per person for the year, which is under half the price it used to be. Um, but we do need everybody to renew to may enable us to carry on doing this. So it's £10 a year. There's the details how to do it. But again, more details on our website and in the newsletters as well. As I said, actually I haven't had any news from any of you this week and we would love to hear from you. Um, I'm going to mention again what I did last week which is that uh, Chris G4CCX who is silent key and he had a lot of radio equipment as you know. There is another auction next Wednesday the 10th of January at Swardston Village Hall with viewing from 8.45 and the auction starts at 10 a.m. Now, the only, uh, so I would like to just show you this picture. Now, this actually came from Tammy this afternoon. She emailed it to me. She, we took it actually earlier in the year in the summer, and our dear nanny, Edna, um, in her garden was this cat. Edna passed away, as you may know, in August. But she had this neighbor, and then her neighbor had a cat. And this, if there's not very stealthy way of having a cat waiting in a bird box, and we've waited till now to sort of show you that. It reminds me, I don't know if you know the uh, Morkman Wise sketch, it reminds me when Eric said, there was a sound of a police car siren going past really fast. And he said, you're not gonna sell many ice creams going that fast. Well, <laughs> this reminds me of that really, because I don't think Hattie is gonna catch many birds hiding in the bird. <laughs> a table like that but anyway thank you very much for sharing that Tammy this afternoon. Now although Tammy is ill um, from her bed she 
looked at little people because uh, she's here in spirit, as I said, and um, she sent us the little people for this week. And uh, here's what she entered, what she sent us. And this is apparently what happens to all the old records. Well, they're not so old now. They've come back into fashion, haven't they? Where they end up in an airport as a baggage claim. Miniature-calendar.com. As always, they have a new picture every day. And Tammy picks one for us every single week. So as I said, unfortunately, we haven't really had any news from you this week. So if you had some nice radio equipment or did a nice project over Christmas or anything at all for the show, it doesn't have to be radio related as well. It's just a nice thing to share. We will be back again live on an arc Live next Wednesday. Um, and then we're going to a meeting at the school. But next Wednesday we'll be back. So if you've got anything that you could send us, I'd really love to see it. This is the address to send it to. Radio at dcpmicro.com. And if you can get it to me by, say, 3 o'clock next Wednesday at the latest, that would be great. We'd love to see your pictures and your news and everything else. Thank you. Now, on to that competition, which we've run every week for many, many weeks now. And last week, I asked you, what on earth is this? And we had a few entries, I'm glad to say. I can't actually see answers now. I can't see anything that's been entered by anybody here. So that's good. Okay, so I've got the people who wrote in. Brian M7SEY says, he thinks it's a solar lighter. The heat is generated by a concentration of the sun's rays by the convex mirror within the spring area in order to ignite the material that you place there. Either that or it's an Acme wrist satellite radio antenna for commodity brokers on the go. Ha ha. Happy New Year, everyone. That was from Brian M7SEY. Bruce G4KZT says, I think this object is a solar powered cigarette lighter. Hmm. Alternatively, if you feed RF in at the right frequency into the top of the spring, which is like a helical antenna, you would have a microwave dish beam. <laughs> Nev M0NFY, he says, well, it looks like a soldering iron stand, but it probably isn't. We'll find out in a minute, Nev. And Colin M0GMK says, I guess this week's object is a solar fire starter where the sun's rays are focused onto the twisted basket containing a combustible material as tinder. Not very effective in these dark days, he says. And the answer is, it is a parabolic solar fire lighter and sent to us by David M6 DPZ. How did you get on at home? I had never seen one of these and I might have been tempted to say something like Nev did, I think, maybe it looking like a soldering iron stand, but anyway. Wonderful bit of technology. Never heard of one, never seen one, but sounds like it's uh, pretty amazing if you put some tinder, or some straw or something in the bottom there and you're in the middle of nowhere and you haven't got any matches and there's a sun shining. Maybe that's a good answer. Anyway, thanks very much for sending us that, David. Let's have a look now and find out, do you know what on earth is this? Hmm. It's easy for me, isn't it? Because I know what it is. Do you know what that is? Have a good look. We'll be putting it on Facebook and on our website. And you've got until three o'clock next Wednesday to let us know. But if you know now, please drop me an email, radio at dcpmicro.com. You get in there first and we'll read out all the uh, entries that we get next Wednesday. And of course, then we'll reveal what it is. And also, as I did say actually last week, we are running quite low on items, although we get it, I did get two or three sent to me this week, so that's great. But if you've got an unusual object or something that you could send us to, for this competition, then please do it. Send it to the usual address, which is this, radio at dcpmicro.com. Do you know, doing this, I now realise all the things that Tammy does and why she's got headphones on and why she's looking at all the buttons and things to press. Never take it for granted. We're nearly ready for our next guest now, just to let you know that it's happening at the club this week. Um, on Sunday, we've got the GB2RS News on GB3MB. That's back after a, a break over Christmas. On Monday at half past seven, the Monday Night Net on GB3MB as well. And at eight o'clock, the 80 metre CW Net on 3.543 megahertz. And then next Wednesday, January the 10th, 
we've got Mike Richards, G4WNC, who's giving us a talk about the VAR AC application. It's a free modern uh, HF point-to-point -point real time chatting application for amateur radio. And Mike always gives us an interesting and different talk, doesn't he? So that's what's happening next Wednesday. It's here on NARC Live, online at the usual time from 7.30. So the following week we'll be meeting at CNS, our first meeting of the year. So please don't forget to keep in touch with all of those stories and pictures and anything else that you can send us. And also, if you've got any mystery objects as well, we'd love to see them. This is the address as always, radio at dcpmicro.com. And also, if you would like us to send one of these cards to anybody, here we are. This is the card that we'll be very happy to send to anybody who can be cheered up by a card. We'll add your name to ours and send them off to them. Just send me the name and address, uh, who it's to, and uh, we'll be glad to send them off. So, it's a now a great pleasure to welcome, if I can press all the right buttons, our guest in the States, which is Frank. W3LPL. Let me just make sure I press the right button here. Frank, good to see you. Yes, I'm, it's a pleasure to be here in the new year. Yes. And a happy new year, everyone on the, uh, who's uh, uh, watching. Thank you very much, Frank. Yeah, it's really good to see you again. You're going to talk to us tonight about um, propagation and what we might see and hear this, this year, isn't it, for, in, in our hobby? Yes, there's a lot of excitement ahead. Good. All right. Well, I'll, without further ado, I'll hand over to you. Hopefully I'll press the right buttons and we'll see your slides. And uh, as always, if you've got any questions for Frank, uh, I will try and read them to him at the end. So put them onto Facebook or BATC messaging. Got a nasty buzz in my ear, but I think that's, uh, that's local. So thanks very much, Frank. Over to you. Okay, uh, David. Um, I'll uh, share a PDF of these slides with you, and you, if you wish, you can put them on your website or share them in any way that you'd like. Thank you very much. That's great. Thank you. So this is an image of the active sun, and you can see there's a lot going on. This, this is a historic photo. It's not real time. But uh, this is kind of what the sun looks like at this part of the solar cycle with lots of things going on on the visible disk of the sun. Uh, those are active regions that you see that uh, contain sunspots. And a lot of the streamers that you see coming uh, from the sun are called coronal hole high-speed streams. And we'll talk about those in just a bit. These are some of the topics we'll cover. I'll just mention that each of these topics could be the uh subject of a phd degree so uh, we're just going to scratch the surface and i'll give you some clues as to how to dig into these uh, in more detail uh, for those of you who have access to qst magazine i wrote an article that appeared in may uh, qst last year and if you can get access to that uh, you might enjoy reading it uh, it's a couple of pages talking about uh, uh, what's going on on uh, HF and six meters uh, over the next few years. For those of you who'd like to learn more detail, there are uh, these three publications. Two of them are available from RSGB. Uh, the least expensive of these, it's uh, actually quite a bargain, is the one on the right-hand side, uh, here to there, radio wave propagation. The URL on the RSGB shop, uh, shop is uh, shown at the bottom of the page. This is an excellent uh, publication uh, written for uh, uh, amateurs at kind of a beginner to moderate level. The other two publications, uh, only one of which is available on the RSGB uh, shop uh, page is the ARRL Antenna Book. It's a very, very excellent book. I was asked to contribute uh, quite a bit to this book, and uh, so many other uh, very qualified amateurs contributed to it. It's a major rewrite, well worth the cost. The other book, the Edible RL Handbook, is uh, also available. It contains a great deal of information about propagation. The antenna book contains somewhat less, and uh, unfortunately is not available on the RSGB shop uh, page, but if anyone's visiting the States, you can uh, find one or you can get someone to send it to you that way. 
or places like Amazon.com have it as well. Uh, these are professional grade books written by uh, amateurs with a great deal of experience, but written by amateurs for amateurs. So it's much more readable than the professional text that uh, backs these up. This is an excellent free technical reference available on the internet. It's written for professionals, so it's more difficult to read um, than the three books I uh, just showed. But it's available online for those of you with uh, a technical background. So uh, these are, are terms that every amateur that's active on HF should be at least familiar with. Uh, sunspots are contained in regions on the sun known as active regions. Uh, and it's from these regions that uh, ionizing radiation uh, occurs from and, and uh, solar disturbances such as coronal flares what that we'll talk about and coronal mass ejections also occur from these active regions. Of course, this uh, talk is about uh, solar cycles. Nominally, they're 11 years in length, but they can vary in length quite a bit. We don't know how long this one will be. Uh, it's behaving like it'll be about the nominal 11 years. Uh, ionizing radiation is what uh, causes the ionosphere and allows us to communicate over very large di distances. Uh, if you uh, use GPS, and almost all of us who have cell phones these days, days have access to GPS. It's also a, this ionizing radiation can cause problems for GPS phones because the um, satellite phones, I should say, and uh, some of the links for terrestrial GPS uh, for terrestrial phones uh, pass through the ionosphere to get access to the satellite. So Ionizing radiation can cause a problem for any user of GPS, whether it's uh, satellite phones or uh, anyone on the internet that uses uh, GPS related services. Uh, out of a typical uh, nominal 30 day month, about 20 days are uh, kind of normal. And a lot of what we'll talk about today is normal propagation. But about five days out of the month are exceptionally good for HF propagation. And nominally, uh, five days or so a month are very bad. Uh, this is just the normal sequence of events uh, near the top of the solar cycle. You get, you get normal and very good and very bad um, during the course uh, of a month. The, uh, the sun course, is a star, and it's like all the other stars, it's a gas star, it's not solid. And uh, the, our sun, uh, because it's a gas star, its uh, rotational period varies with latitude on the sun. What we're mainly interested in as radio amateurs is the rotation period uh, at the latitudes on the sun at which sunspots occur. And uh, at those latitudes on the sun, the rotation period of our gas star is nominally 27 days, which causes uh, major events on the sun to repeat about every 27 days. And also the Earth is tilted significantly. Uh, 23 and a half degrees, it causes our seasons, but it also causes the interaction of the Earth and the sun to vary with the seasons. So uh, there's quite a bit of uh, variability in HF propagation uh, between the seasons, and we'll talk about that. So this is uh, these are images of the sun taken at solar minimum, and you'll notice that very dark region uh, in the sun there. It's, it's huge, um, the size of tens of thousands of Earths, and that's called a coronal hole. Uh, it's an area of the sun's corona that uh, is uh, open to a radiation of, uh, to particle radiation, and it's uh, they're particularly prominent uh, during the 
declining years of the solar cycle and at solar minimum. The image on the right side is what we would see with a solar telescope today. And that's a great deal of uh, sunspot activity on the sun. And again, this is a historical photograph. It's not current, but this is what the sun would look like on, a, on an active day, which is most days at this part of the cycle. So uh, kind of the takeaway of this is that uh, uh, solar maximum brings some wonderful uh, propagation opportunities on uh, mainly 40 through 10 meters, but it also brings some pretty badly disturbed days. So they, they go uh, hand in glove, you get both. So let's take a look uh, at some historic sunspot cycles. Uh, the, the real takeaway from this slide is that uh, the northern hemisphere of the sun has its own solar cycle, and the southern hemisphere of the sun has its own solar cycle. They're, with, they're nominally within about two years of each other. And the last solar cycle, 24, uh, actually had two distinct peaks. Um, the second peak was a little stronger than the first one. But when the first peak occurred in uh, 2012 in the northern hemisphere of the sun, many of us were worried that this was solar maximum and uh, things were only going to get worse. And they got to be very poor during 2013. But then in 2014, the southern hemisphere of the sun came to life and uh, we had some pretty good propagation in 2014. And then the inevitable decline occurred. Um, so during some years, the, the uh, solar cycles in the northern and southern hemispheres of the sun are fairly well aligned. And in some years, they're quite far off. And in uh, the last cycle, they were off by two years. That uh, has the effect of not only have a, having a double peaked uh, solar maximum, it also has the effect of attenuating the strength of the solar maximum because uh, you don't get the benefit of the two uh, solar cycles in each hemisphere overlaying each other. It occurred at different times. And in, and in this one, you can clearly see that the uh, southern hemisphere uh, solar cycle shown in green in 2014 was fairly strong, but the uh, northern hemisphere solar cycle was already quite attenuated, so it didn't contribute that much uh, to the total uh, amount of sunspot activity as would have happened if the two cycles were aligned. So uh, a wonderful thing about sunspot forecast is that there's probably a hundred of them out there, probably more than that, and you can pick your favorite forecast. Um, and so you, you can kind of decide what outcome you'd like and you can find a forecast that'll match that outcome. Well, I uh, tend to focus on this particular uh, forecast by NASA, it's updated monthly. Uh, it's uh, produced by the Marshall Space Flight Center in Houston, Texas. They have a very important mission of uh, protecting the lives of uh, astronauts in space. So, so the quality of their forecast is exceptionally important, and I uh, tend to follow theirs. So this is their forecast that they issued just a few weeks ago. And uh, like I said, about every month they update it. Um, and it shows uh, three alternative forecasts. Uh, one of them is very pessimistic, shown in red. And it's very apparent already that uh, this forecast is unlikely to take place. It shows that we've already achieved solar maximum and we're rapidly declining. Well, that's just not happening. So the red one is not likely to be true. And the one shown in blue is a very optimistic forecast. Uh, it's possible that it could occur, but we're not seeing the very rapid continued increase in sunspot activity that would be required for this uh, forecast shown in blue to be true. Uh, on the other hand, the forecast shown in green, which they rate as being about 50% likely to be correct, uh, seems to be tracking what's happening on the sun pretty closely. Um, so this is sunspot forecast. 
many amateurs like to use the solar flux as an indicator of uh, solar activity rather than sunspots. Uh, solar flux is closely related to uh, ionizing radiation. Now, ionizing radiation is ultraviolet. And uh, fortunately for us humans that live on the surface of the Earth, if this intense uh, ultraviolet radiation made its, all, made its way all the way to the surface of the Earth, we wouldn't be here. Uh, we couldn't possibly survive. But uh, it's attenuated by the atmosphere and doesn't make its way to the Earth, so we can't measure ionizing flux directly. So uh, we have to use uh, alternative measures that are closely related. And the solar flux, that is the, the solar radiation, measured at uh, a wavelength of uh, uh, 10, at a, at a frequency of 10.7 gigahertz, I'm sorry, 10 point, a wavelength of 10.7 centimeters, uh, very closely uh, tracks uh, ultraviolet radiation. Um, it's not the same. This, the solar flux measured at uh, 10.7 centimeters is not uh, ionizing radiation, but it is a, a very excellent proxy that we can measure on the Earth, and we've been measuring it uh, every day since 1947. And it, it continues to be the preferred way to measure uh, the progress of, uh, of solar cycles and their effects on HF radio and satellites and lots of other things. And this is another uh, related forecast from, from the Space Weather Prediction Center uh, operated by NOAA. And it's uh, not surprisingly tracks the 50% forecast I just showed you, it shows uh, a forecast peak of the current solar cycle uh, during 2024, likely before the end of the year. And their website is shown here. Um, now, along with the good aspect of ionizing radiation that brings us improved HF propagation, as I mentioned, along with that comes disturbed uh, days nominally five rather badly disturbed days per month. And one of the measures for that is uh, called the AP index. And you can learn more about that in some of the books that I read you, uh, I uh, showed you on the uh, early slides in the presentation. It's a, a measure of uh, geomagnetic disturbance. And uh, the NASA Marshall Space Flight Center also forecasts this, and they do it in a similar way. And the forecast that is most likely to be true is the one shown in green, which shows a peak of the disturbances to occur uh, towards the end of 2026. Um, so the, sun, the sunspot cycle maximum is likely to occur this year, but the disturbances are likely to get worse and worse as the years go by, and they're likely then to gradually start to taper off after 2026. Uh, this is another way to look at the solar cycles. Uh, the time scale here is uh, 2008 to through 2024. Uh, and what this shows in uh, blue is the smooth sunspot cycle number, or the sunspot number, smooth number. And you can see, if you examine it, that, that, that the blue line uh, six months ago is already uh, a higher number than occurred during the last solar cycle in 2014. So this shows in a definitive way that uh, this sunspot cycle is somewhat stronger than the last one. Uh, we don't know if the two sunspot cycles are going to be well aligned or if we're going to have a double peak. We'll just have to wait and see. This is a comparison of uh, the current solar cycle shown in black. And the black line shows the progress of this solar cycle measured by sunspot number. Uh, 
But in this case, the time scale is in months after solar minimum. Uh, why do we change the scale so that we can compare uh, all of the modern uh, sunspot cycles to one another? So they all uh, appear on this graph aligned with the beginning of the solar cycle. Now, what you can see clearly in this graph, if you follow the, the black line and compare it to the cycles that had very high sunspot numbers, all of those cycles that had high numbers, in other words, they appear towards the top of this page, they rose to those high spot sunspot numbers very rapidly, much more rapidly than this solar cycle. So we know with high confidence that because this solar cycle rose more like the weak cycle shown in this graph, that this one is also uh, going to be a relatively weak cycle and there's really no probability that we're going to have the kind of big sunspot cycle numbers that we had uh, uh, before uh, 2000. This expands out a little bit uh, what's going on in the northern hemisphere of the sun and the southern hemisphere of the sun. The uh, the red and the green lines uh, show the uh, monthly smoothed uh, sunspot numbers. Uh, and you can see the red and the green lines are pretty well aligned. So, so the evidence uh, would tend to say that these two sunspot cycles may reach their peak this year at about the same time. Uh, we don't know if that trend will continue, but uh, they're much better aligned than they were in the previous sunspot cycle. The other two lines in black and in blue uh, show the, com the combined effect of the uh, northern and southern hemisphere uh, sunspot cycles. Um, and uh, you can see, interestingly, that we had an interesting peak of uh, sunspot numbers in January of 2023. And it's quieted down somewhat uh, over the rest of uh, 2023. And uh, we're very much hoping that January 2023 was not the sunspot maximum and that we'll see a lot more activity this year. But we just have to wait and see. The sun has no respect for our forecasts and we'll just have to see what happens. So we're going to talk about uh, uh, some of these negative effects of sunspot activity. We've already talked about the positive ones. I'm not going to read these slides in detail. Uh, David is going to make these slides available uh, uh, after this presentation for anyone who wants to read these in further detail. So I'm just going to cover the main points uh, of each of these slides. Uh, coronal holes are areas of the sun, usually very, very large areas of the sun, much bigger than sunspots, that have open magnetic fields that allow charged particles to escape from the sun and they form something called the solar wind. So the solar wind is uh, particles that radiate from the sun, not, not electromagnetic radiation, not light, but actually charged particles that uh, radiate from the sun. Uh, and uh, the solar wind is always present. Um, and the main thing that varies with time is the speed of the solar wind, which is important because uh, the speed of the solar wind relates to how uh, significantly the solar wind uh, interacts with the Earth's ionosphere. And uh, this solar wind, when it is uh, uh, traveling at a higher speed, uh, can affect the ionosphere in a pretty pretty severe ways, causing uh, uh, geomagnetic storms. And we'll talk in just a moment about another type of radiation from the sun called, called a coronal mass ejection, which can cause very intense geomagnetic storms and affect HF propagation in a very severe way. So this is uh, uh, the appearance of uh, uh, coronal holes on the sun's surface, they're massive structures. 
and they show at the wavelength uh, of light that was uh, used to take these photographs uh, the size and location. And the, this particular, so, so, what, so what we're seeing on the image on the left is the visible disk of the sun facing towards the earth and this huge uh, coronal hull uh, radiating charged particles uh, into the solar wind. And on the right side is the, the same thing showing uh, a coronal hole that has rotated uh, with the 27 rota day rotation of the sun over towards the uh, limb of the sun rather than pointed directly towards the earth. So coronal hole high speed streams. So these are, these are streams of charged particles from the sun that are that are traveling at fairly high rates of speed. Uh, when they're traveling at higher speeds, they can cause uh, minor geomagnetic storms. Uh, they're uh, relatively uh, infrequent near solar minimum, but they occur quite often during the years after solar maximum. So those, uh, those uh, forecasts I showed you before of the AP index showing the, uh, let me get rid of this thing. Okay, showing the AP, the AP index peaking in 2027. That's what it's referring to is these coronal hole high speed streams, which will become increasingly uh, uh, prominent during the next uh, three years. So the sun is a gas star. And the, uh, the the rate of rotation uh, of the gases on the star vary with latitude. And because of that, it causes twists and tangles of the uh, of the magnetic field. Um, which then cause uh, disturbances on the sun uh, related to uh, these active regions. And I'll show you another uh, view of this. So this is uh, illustrates the rotation of the sun. Uh, the sun is tilted seven degrees uh, with respect to the uh, orbital plane of the Earth. So what happens here is that sunspots uh, when they rotate around the sun, appear to move to higher and higher latitudes, but that's not actually the case. Um, it's because the sun's axis is tilted. And to further complicate the relationship between the Earth's magnetic field and the sun's magnetic field, the, the Earth, of course, is tilted uh, 23 and a half degrees, but its uh, magnetic field is uh, tilted 11 degrees. And that causes uh, variability of the uh, magnetic fields radiating from the sun and the solar wind and how they affect the earth. Um, these videos shown here uh, illustrate uh, sunspots uh, and active regions. In the upper left-hand corner is one of the largest sunspots ever seen. And you can see that that sunspot is bigger in size than the, than the uh, diameter of the Earth. It's a massive sunspot. In the lower left-hand corner is a uh, short video that shows an active region with uh, multiple sunspots as it uh, rotates uh, around the sun, as the sun rotates. So you can see the variability there. And in the upper right-hand corner is a a highly magnified view of a sunspot. So you can see that very dark region in the middle, and uh, that, that image is repeating about uh, once every two seconds. Um, and the ionizing radiation from the sun, the, the uh, radiation that, that creates the ionosphere on the Earth, actually doesn't radiate from the sunspot, it radiates from the region surrounding the sunspot. So one of the uh, very uh, 
severe uh, types of disturbances that originate from the sun is called a solar flare. And some of the strongest solar flares also have associated with them uh, very strong coronal mass ejections. And this video on the left shows uh, probably billions of tons of material being ejected from the sun. So this uh, is a coronal mass ejection. And the uh, photograph on the right shows an, act, an active region with multiple sunspots and uh, some of the radiation that occurs, particle radiation that occurs from these areas. So solar flares produce uh, very intense X-ray radiation. And this X-ray radiation causes what are called radio blackouts on the Earth. The uh, X-ray radiations travel at the speed of light. So within about eight minutes after they occur on the sun, a, a very intense solar flare can cause HF propagation to go away. Now, because this is uh, X-ray radiation, it only affects the sunlit side of the Earth. The X-ray radiation cannot affect the nighttime side of the Earth. So one of, one of these solar flares causes a radio blackout. It's always during the daytime. The very strongest of these solar flares are called X-class. And uh, also, uh, the, the next uh, strongest is called M-class, and only the strongest of the M-class uh, solar flares uh, cause significant problems. But the X-class ones can cause very severe problems. And we had a what's called an X-5-class, which is uh, one of the strongest ones we've seen uh, in the last uh, 11 years. And it caused HF propagation to basically... Uh, cease for more than an hour, uh, and I believe that was last Thursday. And we're going to see more of these and maybe even stronger ones, although a, an X5 class is uh, quite strong. So as I mentioned, uh, radio blackouts caused by flares only occur on the daylit side of the Earth, uh, never at night. Although if, if propagation is propagating from the night onto the daylight side of the Earth, it will affect that propagation. So, for example, if, if uh, North America is still in daylight and we're communicating with a station in the UK uh, during the night, uh, we might lose that propagation uh, because of the uh, stations in the US still being sunlit. And uh, this this uh, little video clip shows an X-class solar flare. Um, and this was a very powerful one that also had a coronal mass ejection associated with it. This video is of the largest ever recorded solar flare. It was an X-28 flare, which is far, far more intense than the one that occurred last Thursday. Um, and on the right side is a graph that shows uh, flare activity during a very active time uh, in November 2003. And there were four X-class uh, flares that occurred during those four days. So uh, as we uh, get further and further into the solar, solar cycle, we're going to have more and more coronal mass ejections, which are often associated with, but not caused by, often associated with solar flares. And these can cause very severe geomagnetic storms on the Earth that can affect HF propagation for days. Norm normally, solar flares affect HF propagation for an hour or two, but coronal mass ejections, which are charged particles, as opposed to X-rays and solar flares, uh, these can affect HF propagation for days. And this uh, this little video clip shows a coronal mass ejection um, from the sun and going out into space. Now, see, coronal mass ejections occur 
many times per week at this part of the sunspot cycle. But fortunately, uh, most of them miss the Earth. It's very difficult to predict whether they are going to, to hit the Earth or not. So sometimes if you follow uh, propagation forecasts, you'll see forecasts of uh, degradation caused by coronal mass ejections, but then they don't happen. And uh, usually that's because the man coronal mass ejection just missed the Earth. So all these uh, ejections of charged particles contain strong magnetic fields. And the effect of the coronal mass ejections is very much amplified if the magnetic field uh, of the particles coming from the sun is oriented opposite from the magnetic field of the Earth. Uh, just think about uh, some of the experiments you may have run when you were a young person with two magnets. And you know, in one orientation, the magnets attract very powerfully. And uh, that's when they're opposite from each other, opposite fields. And if you flip the one of the one of the magnets uh, so that the magnets oppose each other, then the forces will will push them apart. And the same thing happens with these coronal mass ejections from the sun. So if we're fortunate and the coronal mass ejection uh, magnetic field is opposite from the sun's magnetic field, uh, will have major effects. And if the, if, if the two fields are oriented towards each other, just like the magnets we experimented with, uh, those, the two fields will oppose each other. So th these uh, CMEs, and it's the more powerful ones we worry about, called fast CMEs, uh, occur uh, mostly during the, suns the active region, uh, the active periods on the sun, uh, so we can expect to see those for the next three or four years. Uh, they're starting to occur very frequently now. Um, if you recall earlier in the presentation, I showed how the, the sun's rotation is uh, tilted seven degrees and the earth's rotation is tilted 23 degrees and that causes these uh, the magnetic fields of the, of the interplanetary magnetic uh, field to be aligned with the Earth's magnetic field in a way that amplifies the effects of coronal mass ejections uh, during the equinoxes on the Earth. So for a few weeks before and after the equinox and the fall and the spring, the ionosphere is especially uh, susceptible to the negative effects of coronal mass ejections. Um, and that's especially the case if these CMEs originate from locations on the sun that are directed towards the Earth. Um, uh, and, and also with the latitude, so if the longitude is uh, uh, oriented towards the Earth, and if their latitude is uh, closer to the solar equator, the effects of these uh, coronal mass ejections, billions of tons of charged particles, uh, is amplified if, if it occurs when it's directed towards the Earth. So plus or minus 30 degrees solar longitude from the center of the sun facing the Earth and within 30 degrees latitude of the uh, solar equator. So we're going to take a quick look at HF propagation and how it's affected by all of these uh, physics things that we talked about. Uh, solar maximum from a propagation perspective is not a particular date on a calendar. It's a period of about three or four years when sunspot activity is high enough to improve, especially the higher bands that we operate on. So the solar maximum propagation conditions began in January last year. And in fact, it's the most sunspot activity that we've seen so far in this cycle it was uh, just about one year ago. And this uh, solar maximum propagation conditions are likely to 
continue through the end of about 2026. 10 and 12 meters have been especially good uh, during this sunspot cycle. Um, and 15 and 17 meters are especially reliable during this part of the sunspot cycle. So there are days, for example, when 10 and 12 meters might not be open, but 15 and 17 meters can be spectacular. Uh, these propagation conditions are likely to continue for about three more years. And also at night, the 20, 30, and 40 meter bands are also uh, affected in a very positive way. So uh, 20 and 30 meters uh, can be open all night long at this part of the sunspot cycle, and 40 meter nighttime propagation is uh, better than it was during solar minimum. But unfortunately, the disturbed conditions we talked about are also becoming more frequently. So we get these five nominally really good days during the month and five really bad days during the month and uh, 20 days of about normal activity. But as the sunspot cycle continues, we inevitably will start to approach solar minimum. And that's about seven years from now, when uh, 10 and 12 meters are essentially dead and 15 and 17 meters are nowhere near as reliable as they are now. So uh, every band has its advantage and disadvantages. Uh, 17, 15, 12, and 10 meters are especially good during the daytime, uh, and especially from September through May. 20 meters uh, is reliable both daytime and nighttime, but it's not so good during the summer, daytime. Uh, so it tends to be a nighttime band in the summer and a uh, daytime band uh, mostly through the other three months of the, of the other three seasons of the year. 40 meters is a very reliable nighttime band at this part of the sunspot cycle throughout the year. Um, and 80 meters provides some good nighttime worldwide propagation, mostly from October through April. Um, so 10 meters for people that operate that band, and this is a very easy band to get active on. Antennas are relatively small, simple antennas like dipole antennas perform very, very well. And we have a lot of available spectrum space in the 10 meter band, so it's not as crowded as the other bands. So 10 meters is a, a wonderful band to operate on. Uh, low power, simple antennas, portable stations work very, very well on 10 meters. And uh, we've had almost daily openings between uh, North America and Europe over the last year, uh, mainly from September through May. Uh, during the summer, uh, we do get some uh, transatlantic propagation, but most of that is a different type of propagation called sporadic E, which is not the topic of this presentation, but if you uh, look online, you could find lots of discussion of that. That occurs uh, mainly uh, during the later part of May through uh, early August. So this excellent 10 meter propagation we're enjoying right now is likely to continue uh, th throughout uh, the next three years until uh, hopefully the end of 2026. Um, in, in terms of uh, activity, uh, worldwide propagation has improved dramatically. Uh, the 17 and 15 meter bands uh, were already uh, much better than they had been uh, during 2022. And the uh, 10 and 12 meter bands have been fantastic uh, since uh, early 2023. Um, let me go to the next slide. Um, uh, Nighttime propagation has also improved dramatically, and that, uh, that improves the performance of the 40, 30, and uh, 20 meter bands. Uh, so let's take a look at some of the individual bands uh, briefly. Uh, the 80 meter band is uh, very much affected by uh, absorption, uh, and as a and as a result, the increased ionization from the sun uh, actually creates undesired absorption and uh, ionization of some of the lower uh, altitudes of the ionosphere. 
As a result, 80 meters has become less reliable as the higher bands have become more reliable. That's not to suggest there aren't some very, very good days on 80 meters. There, there are, but they're less common. Um, maybe a few days a month when 80 meter propagation is really good, but for the most part, it's unreliable. But 80 meters will start to steadily improve after about 2026. Uh, if we look at the 160 meter band, uh, that band is uh, very unreliable now since 2022. Uh, and uh, you really have to be lucky to find a, a, a really a good day on 160 meters. Uh, when that, propagate, when that uh, propagation is good, it's likely to be uh, for transatlantic propagation from uh, the UK to North America. It's likely to be around the sunrise period uh, uh, in the UK. So these are the last two slides of the presentation. And I'll have time for a couple of questions at the end. I'm not a big fan of propagation forecasting. And why is that? There's so many variables, and we talked about many of these variables at a very, very high level today. There are so many variables that uh, it's very difficult to, to, to uh, forecast HF propagation in a way that's very reliable. But we have available to us now on the internet what uh, is, is often referred to as now casting. That is that we can see the propagation right now that's happening. So uh, we can tell what's happening right now on a global scale. And not only that, we can put a sig our own signal on the air and these tools will detect our signal and report back to us where our own signal is being heard. Uh, this is one of my favorite websites for now casting. It's called the Reverse Beacon Network. Uh, this slide shows some of the uh, fields where you can enter your call sign and uh, the areas of the world that you want to look at propagation from uh, your call sign or any other call sign. This is an easy site to use. Uh, if you want to try it, just go to the website, fill in the fields. You really can't break the website, so you can experiment with it and uh, try uh, calling a CQ. So this site works uh, mainly with CW signals, uh, but also radio tel type, but that's not very popular anymore. Um, but it's a fantastic site for viewing present propagation and propagation of your own signal. Uh, this is my last slide. And if you're active on uh, the FT8 modes or the FT4 modes, this is a very excellent site uh, to also view your own propagation or uh, the other propagation that's going on right now. And this particular slide was uh, 20 meters at 2200Z. And you can see a lot of activity on 20 meters between Europe and all over the United States and from the United States into South America. Uh, you can uh, get on the air on FT8 uh, call a CQ or just make some QSOs and this website will detect your uh, activity and uh, you can look at propagation uh, from your own station. So that's my last slide, David, and I'll turn it back to you and I have a few minutes for questions. I'll be happy to take any questions by email at the address I showed on the first slide. Many, many thanks, Frank. Uh, oh, yeah, I think I've got my mic up. Hopefully you can hear me. Um, I've had to change my mic, so I'm sorry about the buzz earlier on. I think there was an issue with that. Um, so thanks very much to Frank for that. He, do, he did tell me just before we started that he has another engagement that he's going to have to go to pretty sharpish. So we've already got one question. If you have a question for Frank, please don't delay and enter them right now. Um, so let's uh, first read them. Uh, Mike G4DYC. Frank, an excellent presentation. Many thanks. Are there any theories why the strength of solar cycles appears to be diminishing and what will uh, our or, or our successors do when it fades to very low levels that's seven three mike g4 dyc what do you think um mike sorry i'm just going to come to you now yeah uh hello mike and uh, thank you for that question um so in today's presentation i talked only about the 11-year nominal solar cycle 
but there are much longer term cycles as well. Um, honestly, no one knows exactly what causes that. There are theories, uh, one of the popular theories is that these long-term variabilities uh, over many cycles perhaps are caused by some of the large planets, the so-called uh, jovial planets, of which, uh, of which there are four very large planets. And so it might be related to planet stuff, or it, might, or it might be related to some internal process in the sun that we don't thoroughly understand. The good news is, as I showed you, that this solar cycle is a little bit stronger than the last one. So that's a good trend. But what's going to happen in solar cycle 26, we'll just have to wait and see. Yeah, there's no precise way. This is a great way to start the year, by the way. This is our first meeting, obviously, of this year. And it's a great way to start um, seeing, you know, what we might be in for in terms of conditions this year, Frank. So thanks again for doing it right now. We've got, we've got three years of, uh, of very good propagation in our future. So we shouldn't be panicking and thinking that the end of it is coming soon. I know there were there are some proponents of various theories. Scott McIntosh is one, I think, who, who thought we might have almost had it as, as good as we're going to get. But you think this year, just generally, I mean, in a, in a few words, I mean, you think we're we're into a fairly positive phase still of propagation. Yeah, very positive for all of the bands through 10 meters. You know, uh, Scott's, uh, he had a very optimistic forecast for this cycle. It didn't turn out to be as strong as he had uh, forecast. This is a dangerous thing being a forecaster. Uh, the sun has its own mind and doesn't pay any attention to our forecasts. No. So uh, you, you put a forecast out there and the probability is very great that it'll be wrong. But uh, so we had hoped, many of us who are active on six meters were hoping that we were going to get some really great six meter uh, propagation like we had 22 years ago. Well, we have had some good six meter propagation, but it's been very uh, spasmodic and it mostly occurred in October. So we had some transatlantic propagation between uh, Western Europe and the US on a few isolated days in October. We were hoping to see them most days in October, but that didn't happen and probably is not going to happen on six meters. But 10 meters on the other hand, it is absolutely amazing. And it doesn't take an expensive or uh, large station to really enjoy 10 meter propagation at this part of the cycle. Oh, thank you, Frank. Uh, just got a couple more questions. I said, no, you do have to rush off. And actually, as it happens, they're from our two main forecasters in the UK. I'm sure you know both of them. So firstly, from Jim G through YLA. Uh, super interesting talk, Frank. Much appreciated. Is there any evidence of trends in the spacing of the North and South Hemisphere maximums from Jim? Uh, I showed that one slide that showed that the... Uh the alignment between the North and the South Hemisphere is pretty close uh, in this solar cycle. So there isn't any evidence that the, uh, that we're going to have a double peak, but uh, we'll just have to wait and see. Um, this, the, the, this kind of forecasting is very imprecise. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And then our other forecaster, well known in the UK for his uh, RSGB propagation, Forecast. He's the chair of the Propagation Studies Committee, in fact, is Steve G0KYA, I'm sure you know. Um, and he says, what are your thoughts now on Scott McIntosh's rather extreme predictions a couple of years ago? There we are. And I didn't know he was going to ask that. Uh, what do you think, Frank? <laughs> well, Steve, um, I, I think you have to be very brave to be a forecaster. Because uh, the probability is when you put one of these forecasts out, no matter what it'll be, the probability is like 90 percent that you're going to be wrong. Uh, I'm not one of those brave, brave people, and I don't do uh, propagation forecasting. What I like to do for a ham that's active kind of most days is I like to use these now casting sites so I can see what's happening right now. So, uh, you know, unfortunately, Scott's very optimistic prop propagation or uh, solar forecast. He's not a propagation guy, but his uh, solar for forecasting for cycle 25 was way off. He's got lots of reasons why that's the case, but nonetheless, the forecast that he put out there just wasn't accurate. 
No, well, as you say, it's, there's no precise science there. That's why they're a forecast, aren't they? They're not, not it's just like the weather forecast. You don't know it's definitely going to happen tomorrow. Um, but there we are. But there's been a great insight into what we might be seeing at least this year. And thank you very much for this, Frank, for coming and joining us uh, first thing in the new year to set us off and find out what we're going to get from our hobby. I know you have to rush off now. So many, many thanks for joining us this evening. Okay, David, it was my pleasure. And uh, if anyone wants to ask any more questions, feel free to address them to my uh, email address on the first slide. 73, Happy New Year, everyone. Thank you, Frank. Yes, and um, do let me have that slide set as well. And uh, if anybody watching this now would like to see Frank's slide set, drop me an email and I'll send them to you. Once again, Frank, W3LPL, thanks very much. 73. 7-3. And there we are. That almost concludes this week's Night Live. Thanks for your questions and everything. And also, I must say, thanks very much for the uh, lovely comments for Tammy as well, both messaged and also put on the uh, screens. We're very grateful, and I'll pass them on to Tammy. I'm sure she'll feel better soon, hopefully well enough for next week as well. Thank you. We all hope she's back uh, very, with us very, very soon. So just to remind you again what's happening in the club this coming week. On Sunday, we've got the GB Tourist News back. Uh, on GB3MB at 7 o'clock. On Monday at 7.30, the Monday Night Net on GB3MB. At 8 o'clock, the 80 meter CW Net on 3.543 megahertz. And then next Wednesday here again for NARC Live, Wednesday, the, uh, sorry, that's January the 10th, Mike Richards, G4WNC, and is giving us a talk about the VAR AC application, which looks really interesting. And don't forget, please keep your stories and your pictures and your news coming in so that we can share it with everybody else. And also, if you have any of those mystery objects, we'd love to see them as well. I know we've been sent a few in the last few days, so thank you very much for that. And thanks for joining me. So it does feel very strange here. We've got five computers here, and this was never designed to be used by one person, but hopefully we got away with it. Thanks ever so much for joining us, and we'll see you again next week for NARC Live. Take care. Bye-bye.